Order. The sitting is resumed. It is time for questions to the Minister of Health, Social Services and Public Safety. We will start with listed questions, but before I call Rosalind McCorley, I must inform members that questions 9 and 11 have been withdrawn. Ms. Rosalind McCorley. Question 1, please. Mr. Speaker, with your permission, I will answer questions 1 and 8 together. In response to the agreed budget for 1516, a financial plan has been developed, which is expected to deliver a balanced position for 2015 16. However, this financial plan does not permit funding for any new service developments, including those which might support the delivery of transforming your care. That said, the delivery of TYC remains a priority for my department, and the draft commissioning plan direction is clear that the Health and Social Care Board should, in setting out how services will be delivered in 1516, strive to shift services into the community or primary care settings, in line with the objectives of TYC. Both I and my predecessor have been, always been clear that ideally we are working to a three- to five-year implementation framework. Uh, this, of course, is dependent upon financial circumstances. This remains the case, as does the broad requirement identified in the original report for transitional funding to support the new model. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer. But can I ask the Minister if he could? Um, if you could uh, confirm that only 27.5 million has been shifted to care in the community, um, even though there was a target for that of 83 million, am I good? <clears throat> the, the member is, is broadly right in her assessment of the situation. We had envisaged uh, a shifting left, as, as the phrase, the parlance. Uh, the reality is that John Compton, the author of Transforming Your Care, could not have envisaged um, the financial. Uh, backdrop uh, as we presently see it. We have made various bids in order to achieve the 83 million, most of them in the monitoring round, and those haven't been successful. Uh, and therefore, that has put the whole transforming your care process under considerable stress. It's worth saying, however, that there are two aspects to TYC. First is the seed change within the various trusts as they align their working practices within TYC which don't require additional service development or resources, and then there's the £83 million required to make the major changes. And of course, the trusts are implementing on the ground every day service changes which are difficult to quantify their value, but which are reaching the goal of TYC. But what I have the task of doing is to try and find our campaign for the funds to enable us to obtain the, the, the extra additional resources which we need in order to implement TYC. And can I say, um, in my, when I was first uh, appointed to this position, I was asked what one of my prior three priorities was, and I said finding the resources to implement TYC properly was my number two, uh, uh, my number two target, and we're still striving uh, as, as effectively as we can to obtain that funding. Well, call Palm Cameron. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answers um, so far. Can I ask the Minister what potential he believes GP federations offer to deliver transforming your care um, more quickly? Um, the formation of about 20 GP federations covering all of Northern Ireland was one of the basic tenets of transforming your care. In some areas, particularly Greater Belfast, there has been a great deal of progress. In other areas, as I visit individual GP practices, I have been a bit worried that uh, there hasn't been the same success in setting up the federations. I think this is absolutely essential because the days of a one-man or a father and son practice in some remote part of Northern Ireland operating effectively on our own simply isn't a sustainable model. So therefore, it's important that GPs come together. And one practical example is that GPs tell me that a huge amount of their time is spent in prescriptions and repeat prescriptions. And what one of the aims of the federations is to potentially to employ a full-time pharmacist who would take on that entire administrative role to free up the GP for time for diagnosis and referral, etc. So I see it as actually a vital component of TYC. It's a component that clearly is working and working well already, 
In other areas, it is certainly not making the progress we had assumed, and one of my priorities will be to, to follow up with the Board and the implementation team to see what we can do to encourage GPs to coalesce and to have that quantum of resources and experience which is needed to deliver a 21st model of GP care. But do, of course, realise that underlying that is the problem that we are 20 per cent short of GPs in Northern Ireland. And we're going to have through workforce planning to ensure that we get the numbers back up to a level where we have the numbers for federations, because that is a priority at the moment. We are certainly not attracting enough young medical graduates into this field. Well, Fergal McKinney. Thank you, uh, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and I can thank the Minister. There are some, uh, Minister, who uh, are trying to divert uh, attention around the Donaldson Review into the issue of hospitals and numbers of them. And I think you will be aware that the people of Downpatrick and Down gave, South Down and Wider gave their answer to that in Downpatrick on Saturday. Uh, but the Donaldson report contained a number of other very important issues, including an underpowered commissioning system and a TY system that wasn't working. Given that its funding was to be out of monitoring rounds and that the Minister either didn't apply in this January's monitoring but certainly didn't get, isn't this system now not only not making progress but in reverse? Well, for, first of all, could I concur with them? I think the estimates are there were between 12 and 15,000 people on the streets of Downpatrick expressing their support for the, the Down Hospital. And I issued a statement saying that I still see the Down Hospital playing a crucial role in health care provision in the South East Trust in the future. Yeah. Indeed, I would say there are more patients going through the doors of Down Hospital than ever before. But I accept the local community have difficulties in that they feel it's the wrong sort of patient, that we're not having enough in terms of ED, accident, emergency and surgery patients. But still, that gives us an indication that there's a, there's a positive role for the Down and I welcome that, the huge support that the community have for that new facility. Uh, regarding uh, TYC, what I would suggest is that no, we're not going into reverse because everyone, including even perhaps himself, are agreed that this is the best way forward for uh, health care structures in Northern Ireland. I see it as making less progress than we would have liked to have achieved. I see that uh, I would argue with them about the monitoring round. We have made a large number of monitoring round bids for extra resources for TYC, but I accept on many occasions there have been much more pressing demands on the Department of Finance and Personnel, and I would not like to be in the shoes of the Minister on the, on the four monitoring rounds per year because, frankly, it's a wisdom of Solomon um, uh, choice that he has to make. But we will continue to do that, and we will continue to find ways of freeing up resources within the Department to continue to push forward TYC, because the fundamental point that John Compton made, and this is the one that we're all going to be very uncomfortable with, is if we don't crack this issue by 2025, the health service simply not, cannot continue the way it's going. We have far too many people up the ladder of health care provision commensurate with their needs. And unless we tackle this issue and grasp it, um, we are in a difficult position. There was a three to five year horizon for implementation I would like to have seen it slightly quicker than that, but we're going at a slower pace, but we're still going in the same fundamental direction. And I need to emphasise that on the ground, apart from the funding issue, there is major progress being made in the implementation of TYC, and no one has been able to tell me that there's a better option for uh, care in the future. Call Ms Sandra over -end. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, can the Minister outline the costs, financial and otherwise, of removing the substance misuse target within the plan? As I understand, um, the inability to develop the service in 2015-2016 was due to a lack of funding. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, and Mr. Deputy Speaker, our Principal Deputy Speaker, there's always one question which comes completely out of the blue, uh, which all the soothsaying and all the predictions of the department have been able to uh, uh, identify what was likely to come. I will get the facts on that. That is, that is an important but a, an issue that hasn't had a huge degree of uh, publicity. I will get the answer to the Honourable Member from the Ulster. I'll write back to her and give her a chapter and verse on that particular issue, one I didn't see coming at all. 
Sir John McAllister. Uh, thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, in listening to the Minister's earlier answers, from the, the Sir Liam Donaldson report, he talks about uh, with transforming your care, and I quote, the policy document transforming your care contains many of the right ideas developing high quality alternatives to hospital care, but few believe it will ever be implemented or that necessary funding will flow to it. Damaging cynicism is becoming widespread. Does the Minister agree that that damaging cynicism, both in the public and indeed in, in hospital managers and amongst uh, doctors, is doing enormous harm to the credibility of of the health service and people maybe wanting to leave that through the voluntary exit scheme as well? First of all, on the voluntary exit scheme, can I reassure him that we will not be using that scheme to take out staff which are essential to frontline delivery only to replace them at the same cost? I mean, that does not make sense. Voluntary exit, I see, is a way of perhaps looking at administration and management rather than frontline services because we are still uh, recruiting staff, and I think it's worth mentioning that since March 2011, we have recruited 218 full-time equivalent consultants, 823 full-time equivalent nurses and midwives, 91 staff grade and specialty doctors, and 409 qualified health, allied health care professionals. And I know people don't like to hear those facts, but that indicates to me a solid investment in frontline service throughout the health trusts and the ambulance service. Now, I accept that whilst we're doing that, uh, we still have to concentrate on delivering TYC, and of course those staff will be doing so. I, it is interesting that Sir Liam Donaldson, who is a world authority, and as I said, the Sir Alex Ferguson of health provision, this is an internationally renowned uh, expert on health, he looked at TYC and he concluded that it still was the best way forward. But he understood the difficulty we were having with funding. So therefore, I see it as a process that is not going as swiftly as we'd like, but I believe we're going in the right direction. We will eventually get there, but it'll be at a slower pace. And it's my role to try and ensure that my colleagues in DFP recognise that and continue to release resources to deliver a, a, a project which is fundamental to future health provision in Northern Ireland. Ms. Paula Bradley. Uh, question two, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. It is not possible to quantify the financial effect of missed appointments on GPs and health and social care organisations. However, it is clear that the real cost to the health service is the missed opportunities for GPs, consultants and other health care professionals to see and treat other patients, which in turn has an adverse impact on waiting times for other patients to receive the treatment they need. We all have a key role to play in ensuring that missed appointments are kept to a minimum and that our valuable health and social care resources are utilised in, in the most effective manner. I would therefore encourage everyone that if they cancel a GP or hospital appointment in advance and they can't attend, that they at least uh, inform the health care professionals uh, so that, that that slot can be allocated to another patient. I accept that there are times when life becomes very complex and individuals cannot make it to the GP surgery or to the clinic or the hospital, but the very least they should do is give adequate warning of that so that another person who's perhaps waiting for an appointment can be slotted in at short notice. And really, that's a deep concern of mine is people are not showing the courtesy to healthcare professionals and letting them know in the first place. Call Paula Bradley for a supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answers thus far and can say that I certainly am in agreement with him that other patients are, are having to wait longer on appointments, and one of the reasons is through this as well. But I can just ask the Minister if he has considered setting a target um, for the number of cancelled appointments and could this improve the situation? Um, first of all, uh, uh, it's worth adding that for 15 16. I'm hoping that by March 2016 we'll reduce the number of hospital cancelled consultant laid outpatient appointments by 20% because sometimes the problem is not with the patient, the problem is with the consultant or the doctor. And indeed, when the Health Committee looked at this issue, we discovered that the Southern Health Trust had implemented a new policy in, in drilling down on cancellations caused by clinicians and had led to a dramatic fall in numbers. Um, so, therefore, if we could get the rest of the health trust into the same standard uh, as the Southern Trust, I think we, we would have a much more efficient system. Uh, 
I, I think the honourable member almost as mentioned the possibility of charging, to, uh, charging for no. So I, targets. Targets. Yes, well, the target would be that by uh, uh, to, 2016 we would have reduced this by 20 per cent. Some members have suggested to me that we charge for uh, missed appointments in the same way that I recently had to pay £25 to my dentist uh, for a missed appointment. Unfortunately, on Friday, I turned up and he extracted two teeth, and I suspect I wish I had missed it in the first place. <laughs> I, I think cheaper than us. <laughs> I would say that I, I believe it would be difficult to implement this um, in a province-wide basis. It's not like the discussion we had this morning, where, uh, for all sorts of reasons, people may not have been able to turn up, and it places the GP or the doctor in a very difficult position. So I'm not minded to go down that route. I'm glad to say that there has been a noticeable drop in the number of cancellations recently. So we're moving in the right direction. But again, informing the Office of the relevant condition is absolutely essential. McLaughlin. Well, good, and I thank the Minister for that response. But can I ask the Minister maybe to comment on the fact that he will be aware that one of the rationales given for cancellation of consultant appointments was consultant on annual leave. Uh, could I ask the Minister to maybe comment on that and to actually clarify the cost of cancelled appointments by consultants to the system? Well, the, the Honourable Member for, for, for is absolutely right. Mm -hmm. and indeed, the Southern Trust, um, when it was implementing its change of policy, made it very clear that there was a totally unacceptable reason for a cancellation of appointment. On the basis that if someone's taking a holiday, presumably they've had to book their flights and their accommodation, they've known in advance, and therefore that should have enabled the Trust to have filled the gaps created. So uh, I would commend the Southern Trust on that measure, and I would I urge other trusts to do, to do the same. Um, <clears throat> my officials, uh, it's difficult to actually pinpoint the total cost. There is certainly a, an intangible cost here because it, it leads to inefficiencies in the system. And we're continuing to monitor and report the number of uh, cancelled appointments. And <clears throat> we've also established a short life working group to establish how information on cancelled appointments could be recorded in order to identify where there has been a direct impact on, on patients and to quantify actual loss capacity. As a result of this work, information on the number of hospital cancelled consultant outpatients appointments uh, that have had an impact on patients is now available. But it is a terribly difficult thing to actually put a financial figure in this because when you think about it, in most cases what simply happens is that if Mrs Smith doesn't turn up, then Mrs Jones or Mr Jones, who has been waiting, goes up to the queue, end of the queue, and therefore it's difficult to assess what's the cost of generating the appointment, and then the cost of, of, of reappointing, and what time was spent by the consultant and perhaps reading up before the, the patient arrived. It is very difficult, but it certainly is a frequent complaint from clinicians at all levels in Northern Ireland that people continue to do this in an irresponsible way. But the good news is the message is getting home and the situation is improving. Mr. Roy Beggs. Th thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, missed hospital appointments has been particularly high in some particular units and in some specialist areas. Can the Minister advise what action he is proposing to take in the, f in the forthcoming year to try and uh, address that specific issue, and in particular around the issue of um, those who may have mental health conditions where absentee rates have been particularly high? The difficulty with <clears throat> many of the patients involved is there's comorbidities. There is a mixture of conditions. And whilst the person, for instance, may be coming in to have a, a, a consultation on their back, they may have had depression, they may have bipolar conditions, etc. So therefore, it's, <laughs> it, it can be very difficult to identify the reason for, for people not attending. And it's, we're not going to differentiate between various reasons or various conditions where there's been cancellations or missed appointments. We're sticking to the target. If we can get it down by 20% by March 2016, then I think we'll have done very well. In addition, the department is proposing a number of performance indicators to monitor outpatient cancellation and non-attendance for new and review appointments. Um, the overall consultation rate in Northern Ireland rose from 4.04 consultations per person in 2003-04 to 6.6 in 13-14. That's an increase of 63% in the North, Northern Ireland's consultation rate per person. Now, that's an incredible increase in such a short period, a 10-year period. And that does show the pressure that our consultants and clinicians are under. 
Equally, as far as GPs are concerned, we have an average of 6.9 appointments per year per person. That's for every one of our 1.82 million population. In the Irish Republic, the average is three, and yet the Irish seem to have a very similar outcomes in terms of health as we do. So quite clearly, Northern Ireland people are very much in love with their GPs and their consultants and are very keen to see them. But I really think we need to rationalise a, the demand on the service, and secondly, to make certain that once people are booked, they actually turn up and present themselves for treatment. Because the other aspect of this is, of course, this can lead to people, their condition, their condition deteriorating significantly and adding further expense to the health service. And there have been many cases, of course, of people who have had onset cancer and other serious conditions who have been missed because they didn't turn up for their appointment. John Dalit. Uh, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, I'm really sorry to hear that the Minister has been in trouble with his dentist, and I hope his mouth is getting better. Uh, the Minister will be aware that 180,000 people a year fail to meet their appointments, matched only by the hospitals themselves, which also cancel 180,000. Would the Minister agree with me that the practice in the Causeway Hospital in Coleraine, where text messages are sent out the day before, is good exemplar material and will he look at that and see how that could be uh, rolled out to other institutions which clearly are not on top of it. Um, I hope the Honourable Member for East London Day won't mind me commenting on the very helpful letter that he recently sent us about the Causeway Hotel. The Causeway Hotel, Causeway Hospital, sorry. <laughs> Freudian slip. <laughs> the Causeway Hospital. <laughs> I think, I, think he knows, I think he knows what I'm referring to, and that was very helpful that he highlighted a, a high standard of service in, in the causeway. Uh, could, I, could I just say that um, there has been a significant reduction, and I've got some cold hard st statistics here. For instance, in 910, there was 1.5 million appointments, of which 172,000 didn't show. That's a 10% didn't show rate. And that has gone down to, in 2013-14, to 9.1 per cent. That is a 1.2 percentage drop. And that's significant. That's an over 10 per cent improvement. So clearly, the message is getting through to the public that you really need to treat your health service with much more respect. Now, I'd like to see a continuation of that uh, and to bring it down to the best performance in Northern Ireland. And again, we're not reinventing the wheel here. On many aspects of health, if we could get all of our trusts performing as well as the best trust in any particular field, Many of our problems will be solved. Mr. Sean Lynch. Silver Tree, question three. Um, Mr. Speaker, with your permission, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, I'll have to get used to that accolade. Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, with your permission, I wish to combine questions three and 14 together. And as you were, the Downs report makes 10 recommendations. In my statement of the 27th of January, I set out a number of actions which are being taken forward to progress some of those recommendations. However, many of the recommendations pose <clears throat> fundamental questions, and I want to ensure that stakeholders have an opportunity to provide their thoughts, which is why I have asked for views and comments on the recommendations to be submitted to my department within a 12-week period. <clears throat> Transformational change takes time, and it will be important to map out such a change fully at the outset and to address the budgetary issues. You will also be aware that some of the changes required to address the recommendations will require legislation and some will require executive approval. However, I am determined to make substantial and steady progress wherever it can be made. With this in mind, I have asked Sir Liam to return to Northern Ireland next year to review progress against implementing his recommendations. Following the completion of the consultation relating to Sir Liam's recommendations, I will inform the Assembly of its conclusions and any further actions which may arise. To Sean Lynch for supplementary. I will get um, going quick as I and I want to thank the Minister for his answer. Can the Minister clarify the position around uh, recommendation one, or can he confirm the cost of the, this review and whether it represents value for money? Um, the Chair of the Health Committee actually announced <laughs> that it was £118,000 from memory uh, was the cost of the Donaldson Review, and as we had engaged one of the leading authorities for a significant period to look at our health service, I felt that that was justified. And yes, I can't stand over. Uh, will we, if we implemented Donaldson, effectively save £118,000? We certainly will, and a lot more. <coughs> um, 
I, recommendation 1 was only one out of 10 recommendations in the Donaldson report. Indeed, it's been slightly disappointing that almost all the press attention has homed in on that issue. Um, we have to have a very honest and open debate in this chamber, because this is where this decision will be made. If we were starting with 1.862 million people today, and bringing them onto an area the size of Northern Ireland and configuring a hospital service, we would never start from where we are today. With 10 a and with the Royal Hospital for Sick Children and six local regional hospitals. That is a model that would never be implemented anywhere in the Western world. Now, we have to accept that because of history and tradition and local uh, support, we are in a, a rather different situation to where we'd be. And the only way forward is for us to have this intelligent debate to decide how do we take things forward, how do we reconfigure our health service to ensure that modern, high tech, high level of service is given to all of our people. Because, frankly, at the moment, there are some aspects of our health service, particularly in rural areas, that are under most enormous stress and strain. And we need to start that debate. Now, some of you may have seen an interview I did on BBC on this very issue uh, with Mark Crothers. I call it elder abuse because I was given an absolute tasting for 15 or 20 minutes on this issue, uh, where he tried to tease out probably the same answers that the, the honourable member from Manor South Rome is trying to do. I am not going to preempt that debate by saying what my views are or what way we should go forward. I am encouraging the entire community to sit down and to look at this terribly difficult situation, which for me is one of the most intractable problems we face in Northern Ireland, and for us to come to consensus on it. Mr. David McNary. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, Minister, as with uh, many things these days, the, it appears anyhow that the Victor Meldries and the Sir Humphreys uh, are performing to their best. So, can you tell me what your assessment is regarding the change in the balance of the, the health service um, between frontline staff and uh, backroom bureaucrats? Could you also say what obstruction you're encountering, if any, with interest groups uh, acting to block the pace of the reforms? Well, well first of all, I, I've just quoted to the, to the House the huge increase in frontline staff that my predecessor, Edwin Putz, instigated, and which I support. Uh, we have the equivalent here of 1,400 full-time equivalent staff have been employed in the health service, additional staff since 2011. Now, if Minister Foster was announcing a factory producing 1,400 full-time staff, we'd all be congratulating her on an outstanding achievement. And though, fortunately, she has been making announcements like that in the last three or four years. So that indicates to me that under the, my predecessor's role and my own, that we are making that commitment. And those folk, we know they're there because we're paying them, and we know they're on the ground working hard. And so therefore, I think it's wrong to indicate that we have this issue about being overstaffed at administrative level and not bringing in resources to frontline care. But I accept that there is a perception that we could be doing more to look at admin and management. And that's why the uh, Permanent Secretary has been tasked to go in and do a full analysis of, of the structures of healthcare in Northern Ireland to see if there is any further level of administration we can take out to pump money into the frontline services. But can I just give a few figures? On an optimistic basis, we could maybe save 15 or 20 million pounds, and that's been very optimistic. I have to find 165 million in efficiency savings for 1516 and an additional 50 million out of the non health trust expenditure that's real money from the fire service the bso the, the public health agency so so that's 215 million pounds that i have to find so even if we waved a magic wand and looked at his concerns about management we're only talking in terms of a 12% of that that's the difficulty we're in and we have to make some terribly difficult decisions in the next few weeks on that issue to George Robinson. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Would the Minister outline what work is already under, underway to implement some of the D Donaldson recommendations? Um, <coughs> we have to be careful here because, of course, if you throw a document out into the public domain for consultation, you have to be very careful you're not seen to preempt uh, some of the decisions of, the, of that, or some of the outcomes of the consultation. So, what I can tell you is that the, the six trusts, including the ambulance service, have already been asked to work with each other, their staff and stakeholders to develop a combined response to the report and its recommendations by April 2015, the end of that month. 
and to urgently consider the never events list for England and to determine its applicability to Northern Ireland. Initial discussions have already taken place with the Board regarding the applicability of the English list of never events. I'm sure members will remember my explanation of what a never event was. And the RQIA has been asked to speed up the programme for unannounced inspections of hospitals. A number of pilot inspections have been taken place between April and will take place between April and June 2015. So I hope that shows that in the areas where clearly there wasn't much in the way of dissension or where there had been already discussion, we are already setting up procedures to implement it. But clearly also what we want to hear is from the public's view on Donaldson, particularly on recommendations two to ten, where we need an awful lot of debate as well as recommendation one. That concludes the question, listed questions to the Minister. We will now move on to topical questions. Question 1 has been withdrawn. I now call Mr Phil Flanagan. Minister, last week saw the, the tragic death of 13-year-old Oshin McGrath from, from Belcoo. Um, and Oshin achieved much in a, a very short life. Um, and His passing is a, a terrible loss to his, his family, um, to the wider McGrath and Dolan families and to the many friends that he had. Um, however, as a result of his death and the bravery of his parents, um, five people have now benefited um, from his, organ, um, his organs, um, and they have been given a chance to experience a more fulfilling life. Um, but in February 2013, the previous Health Minister announced a, a public consultation on the move to an opt-out system for organ donation with the support of the First and Deputy First Ministers. Can I ask the, the Minister for an update on the introduction of that proposed legislation? Well, first of all, could I thank the Honourable Member for giving me an opportunity to pay tribute to Oshin's family, who took the very brave decision in tragic circumstances to not only save the lives or to enhance the lives of one person but several people by giving up his organs. And I think that example will help enormously in the debate we're having on this issue. And I had actually intended to contact the family to praise them for their courage in that particular issue. I, at the moment, we are waiting uh, the introduction of a private member's bill from the member for Upper Ban, Joanne Dobson. We are also waiting for the results of the PHA's second survey on public attitudes uh, to organ donation. So we are very much at a situation of watching and waiting for events to happen. We are also waiting to see the outcome of the Welsh model, where the Welsh have passed legislation on this particular issue. Uh, to see what happens there, does it lead to a radical increase in organ donation? But we still have we've had our advertising campaign to encourage it. We have nurses employed whose role is to liaise with families in distress, uh, to encourage them to, to donate organs. And so this is a very um, a complex and um, important period in this whole debate. Uh, I suspect for many of us it will be a free vote in this House when eventually uh, Mrs. Dobson's bill comes forward. So I would like to think that there will be progress made within the next few weeks on this because of the various events coming together. Plan again for a supplementary. I thank the, the Minister for his, his answer and, and his comments. Um, Oshin's parents, um, Nigel and Sharon, were forced to make a, a very difficult decision um, on whether to donate Oshin's organs or not. And they decided to do so on the, the belief that it was what he would have wanted to do. Um, and in doing so, they have demonstrated um, huge strength um, in dealing with their tragic loss. But, but parents and families um, should not be forced um, into making this decision. Um, I, I say to the Minister uh, and to his executive colleagues um, to let one of Oshin's many legacies be um, the introduction um, of opt-out organ donation legislation. So can I ask the Minister when um, this legislation is brought forward, and, and I support the, the bringing forward of this legislation, will he row in behind it um, and support it as his predecessor um, and the First Minister previously appeared to do? I will be guided by the Honourable Member for Upper Van as to when we can expect the introduction of the, the first reading of, of her bill, which clearly deals with the very issues that he has raised. Um, that, I am in a difficult position because, as Minister, I have my own personal views, which I have expressed previously on this, but I think it would not be helpful if I was hard and fast on, on those views as Minister. All, all I can say is I think it will be a very interesting test of the maturity of this Assembly when we debate this. It is also going to be very difficult to predict what will happen because it is going to be a free vote, I suspect, for everyone. And therefore, you have got 107 different views on this particular issue it will become uh, clear. So we will wait with interest, and I hope uh, Mrs. Dobson will get a chance to come in because I'd be very keen to see how that's progressing. But do remember that I realise that Oshin's family had to make a very difficult decision. But no matter what happens, even under Mrs. Dobson's bill, 
families will still be consulted. They will still have to make these difficult decisions. I'm on the register. I've made it very clear um, that if I go under a bus, you're welcome to any part of me that saves lives. I remember the courage of a Coal Island family where a young man was killed in a traffic accident and he saved the lives of three people and enhanced the life of another three people. And that example is tremendously important as we encourage people to have the conversation and to make the right decision as far as our nation is concerned. Michelle McElveen. Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, and could I ask the Minister if he believes that savings of 10% can realistically be delivered by the Northern Ireland Fire and Rescue Service in 2015-16? I alluded earlier to the fact that I have to find £50 million direct reductions in funding of what are described as the non-health trust uh, organisations. And I, I've alluded to the fact that I have to find a huge amount of savings in, for 15-16. And we have asked the arm's length bodies initially for their scenarios based on 5, 10 and 15 per cent reductions for 2015. We have had initial uh, examination of the proposals for the fire service. And I frankly consider that savings at the upper end are unachievable. They are not achievable but retaining a safe service. Consequently, the fire and rescue service is working now on a 5 per cent savings target for 2015. And I have made clear that their focus should be on support functions and central management structures rather than frontline service delivery. And I am opposed to any form of compulsory redundancy within the fire service. I will require full detailed plans on how fire service savings can be delivered and a final agreement to the savings proposals after public, uh, pu public consultation uh, and based on public safety. Uh, can I tell you, this has been a very, very difficult issue. The very fact that we have been in a position where we can't define fire and rescue as a frontline service in the same way as, for instance, blood donation or ambulance is causing us huge difficulties. But that which was agreed by the executive, and we're working with the fire service to find ways in which they can achieve their savings at the least possible impact upon the frontline services, which are not only fire, of course, they're traffic accidents, they're flooding, etc. And I have seen proposals, for instance, to take out some management staff out of health service headquarters in Lisburn. Uh, we think that is doable without affecting frontline uh, support services, but this has been one of the most difficult issues we've faced as a department. McElveen for a supplement. Thank you, and I thank the Minister for his answer. In acknowledging the challenges which he has outlined, could I ask the Minister if he believes that the transatlantic trade and investment partnership would make the health service challenges even more difficult? We have had a lot of letters and questions from members right across the board on this particular issue. For those who maybe are not aware, the TTIP is a transatlantic trade agreement between the United States and the European Union. Now, my colleague Ndeti is very keen on this arrangement because it could open up new markets for Northern Ireland exports and further trade across the Atlantic. But there is a concern that it would open the door for private American companies to come in and uh, basically take over the running of the health service in Northern Ireland. And I've seen a petition calling for the NHS to be taken out of TTIP, but there's no evidence at all to indicate that it is to be included. And there's never any indication in the negotiations that that will happen. And contrary, and members will have seen this in some of the written re replies I've made, I've received assurances that EU member states will remain in full control of their public services, including their public health provision, the EU has followed a consistent line of excluding public health systems from free trade agreements, and I want Northern Ireland to continue to determine how we run our own public services. I want the fundamental basis of the health service in Northern Ireland to remain the same, free at the point of demand, paid for by the taxpayer, and available to all. And I cannot see how that model sits comfortably with any buy-in from the United States. And frankly, even if I, in a wild, mad rush, decided to do that, this assembly would block it immediately, and that would be absolutely right. So as far as I can see, for the foreseeable future, I can see no change in provision in, of health service in Northern Ireland, and I don't see the remotest interest on elected representatives to change the present model in any way. Mr Ian Milne. Well, my good uh, previous on Collier, and I'd like to ask the Minister there when he intends to introduce the um, Mental Capacity Bill. Good. Yes. Um, I've sat on the Health Committee and I sat on the Justice Committee, and I think I asked on six separate occasions when are we going to see this legislation. I am told that it is definitely coming before Easter of this year. 
Why that is absolutely crucial is that if we're going to get this legislation through this assembly and this mandate, we need to see this legislation very, very quickly. The complication has been is that we decided uh, about a third way through the process to combine the mental health income capacity to cover both health and those uh, over uh, adults in, under the, um, uh, in the prison service. And that did cause complications. And I'm working alongside DOJ at the minute on the development of the bill, and it's my aim to submit a draft bill to the executive next month, and we hope the executive will pass that very quickly. And with a view to having it uh, its first reading in the Assembly in March 2016, that is absolutely imminent. Could I say if that doesn't happen, I'll be asking some very pertinent questions, because this is perhaps the most important piece of legislation that my department will be uh, pursuing in this mandate. I was here when the previous bill went through in, two, in 1994, sorry, 1984. And little did I think that I would still be here for the, the next updating of that legislation. Can I make it absolutely certain I will not be here in 25 years' time when the third bill arises? But he's raising an important point, and I'll check again with my officials to see that that deadline of March 2016 will occur. Mr. Milner, for a supplement. Thanks, uh, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer and uh, for his determination in uh, pr producing this bill and bringing it to a conclusion. Uh, can I ask then you know, uh, how the Minister can address the concerns that this legislation leaves out the under-16s? Um, the Children's Law uh, Society um, Office has been lobbying us consistently to include under 16s in the bill. First of all, I have to say that that lobbying started at a process of the bill's formulation that if we had gone down that route, we would have to completely reconsult on the entire bill. That would have knocked it back for, for a very long time and really was impractical. Uh, I understand that there has been uh, negotiations. Uh, with, with the, the Law, uh, Children's Law Society, and they, um, I think they're reasonably reassured as to why we've taken this decision. The bill is a decision-making framework for adults. Uh, there's already a, a, a decision-making framework in place for children, a, 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 a framework that safeguards children at its core and that recognises the importance that society places on the role of parents when it comes to making decisions in respect of children. And the bill, as proposed, will not affect that. Uh, and it will not re require any changes to the present situation. It will enhance the existing safeguards in the mental health order, which will be retained as a temporary measure. Um, I, I think it is unfortunate that that request was not made at an earlier stage. But I still think, even if it was uh, lobbied for very early on, I do not think we would possibly have reached the stage of at least giving a tentative commitment that we are going to have this bill with it by March 2016. I could see both arguments in this one. But I saw the greater good of getting fit for purpose modern mental health and capacity bill to cover all over 16s quickly, because uh, we just simply cannot afford to delay this any further. Bronwyn McCock. Uh, Minister, given the fact that the Southern Health Trust has approved the closure of, of Lone, Ho Lone House in Dungannon without having conducted a full rural impact assessment, Minister, what assurances can you give to the 8,100 people who signed a petition uh, opposing the closure of Lone House that rural do dwellers will be facilitated um, through the ambulance service and other vital transport provision uh, to access the relocated services? A Craig Avon. The, the, the member has lobbied extensively on this issue, and indeed, uh, along with the MP for the area, I met her this morning to discuss this issue. Um, and as, as she knows, I've become a, a bit of an authority in Craig Avon Hospital over the last two weeks. The difficulty is that all of the medical evidence is telling me that an elderly person, a frail person who needs care, that's best done either in the community or if the person has severe needs done very close to full-blown a &E and ED services and all the diagnostics and equipment and the expertise that's there. The commitment is for a new 64-bed unit in Craigavon. Lone House will not be touched until that's up and running. And as I said to her this morning, we have a commitment to that, but there may be budgeting issues. Will we watch very carefully the progress? But until I am absolutely certain, or my successor is absolutely certain, 
that we have a fit-for-purpose unit available in Craigavon to look after the needy people of Dungannon and South Tyrone. There will be no change in configuration in the own house. But I had negotiations on Wednesday with the, with the folk in Newry who are making the same point about transfer of stroke services uh, from Daisy Hill to Craigavon. Um, I hope I was able to indicate to them that the statistics show that the best chance of surviving a stroke and the best chance of recovering quickly are when you're taken to a bespoke specialist centre of excellence. And that's the same model as far as moving both stroke patients and uh, intermediate care bed patients to, from Lone House to Craig Avon. I know as a rural representative how difficult this is to the community to accept, but I, all I can guarantee her, there will be no question of anything happening to Lone House until we're absolutely convinced that the alternative service in Craig Avon meets the needs of her community. No time for a supplementary. And...